Welcome to week five. This week we will be looking at chapter five, the x-ray tube. We'll be discussing each part of the x-ray tube, including how each selection made at the control panel is going to affect each corresponding part of the x-ray tube. The sole purpose for manipulating electricity in the x-ray circuit is to create the environment in the x-ray tube that's necessary for x-ray production, which we need to obviously create a diagnostic image. The need for us to understand the x-ray tube is twofold. First, we must have a basic understanding of how the tube works to competently and safely formulate the exposure techniques, and we wanna minimize the patient radiation dose as well. Second, we have to have an understanding that is very critical to extending the life of the tube and to avoid damaging it with too many heat units. So we will be discussing each part of the x-ray tube, including how each selection that's made at the control panel is going to affect the tube. There are several procedures and considerations to protect the tube, and we're gonna discuss that as well. Um, we'll discuss quality control considerations to extend the life of the tube, We'll discuss the safe operation and the proper maintenance of the x-ray unit. That is our responsibility. We have to have appropriate operation and maintenance of the x-ray unit um, so that you know, we don't damage the tube and the x-ray unit stays functional. Here you can see, this is a, um, the picture here is a photograph of an x-ray tube. This is a basic rotating anode x-ray tube. The x-ray tube is situated in a protective housing that provides solid, stable mechanical support. The housing is a lead-lined metal structure that also serves as an electric insulator and a thermal cushion for the tube itself. X-ray production is a rather inefficient process and much of the electrical energy that goes into it is converted to heat. The design of the house incorporates an oil bath and cooling fans to help dissipate the heat away from the tube, protecting the tube from the thermal damage. The tube is immersed in the oil bath, which draws heat away from the tube. The cooling fans circulate air around the assembly, which also helps to dissipate the heat. And because of the large current and voltage needed to produce the x-rays, we have to have electrical insulation as well. There are two large electrical cables that enter the housing and are securely attached to the x-ray tube through special high voltage receptacles. Although x-rays are perceived as being produced and traveling in one direction, out through the collimator to the patient and then the image receptor, this is not the case. Um, x-rays are actually produced isotropically, which means in all directions. And another role of the housing is to absorb most of the photons that are traveling in directions other than toward the patient. So you can see in the picture here, you can see how they're just kind of bouncing everywhere, right? So the housing design reduces this radiation and the radiation you can see bouncing around is called leakage radiation. And it reduces it to less than 100 millirinkins per hour at a distance of one meter which is required by regulation. So you can see in this picture here, this is an x-ray tube inside the protective housing. The protective housing with the x-ray tube is situated inside of it. The design of the housing serves as an electrical insulator, again, and the thermal cushion for the x-ray tube, in addition to being a protective device against the physical damage that could happen. There are two notes of caution about the x-ray tube housing. Because it is on for a very extended amount of time, the housing can become very hot. This is most likely to occur with um, the fluoroscopic units and most permanently installed units have the tube located under the tabletop for this reason, because it will limit the possibility of contact and you know the RT or the, even the patient getting burned but mobile fluoro units can easily be touched. So we need to have caution when we're using these 
x-ray units or the um, mobile fluoro units with very long cases because the heating is considerable and they will get very, very hot and there's no protection around them. So be very careful not to touch them. And then second, the high voltage cables are not handles. Some radiographers develop the bad habit of using them as a handle and pulling the tube with these um, high voltage cables, but doing so poses a risk to you and potential for damage to the equipment as well. Pulling on them can actually pull them out of the machine, but of course, if they're not insulated well, then you could get shocked by touching them. So don't use them as a handle. The general purpose x-ray tube is an electronic vacuum tube, and it consists of an anode, a cathode, an induction motor that's encased in a glass or metal enclosure, or it's called an a glass envelope. You can see here on the slide this picture. This is a labeled illustration of this design. You can see that the anode is the positive end of the tube and the cathode is the negative end of the tube. The anode incorporates an anode target and an induction motor, half of which is inside and half of which is outside of the protective enclosure, which is that glass envelope. The anode is discussed in detail um, coming up in the next few slides. The cathode consists of the focusing cup and filament with the supporting wires. And in this picture here, you can see a cross-sectional view of the basic rotating anode x-ray tube. The main purpose of the enclosure is to maintain a vacuum within the tube. Because the production of x-rays involves the interaction between the filament electrons and the anode target, if any air was present, the electrons from the air would actually contribute to the electron stream, causing arcing and damage to the tube. The glass envelope variety is generally made of borosilicate glass because it is heat resistant. However, as these tubes age, vaporized tungsten from the filament deposits on the inside of the glass and this causes a sun tanning effect because of the bronze discoloration of the glass which causes problems with the arcing and damage. The metal envelope variety provides a constant electric potential between the electron stream from the cathode and the enclosure thereby avoiding the arcing problem and extending the tube life. Both enclosure types have a specially designed target window for the exit point of the x-rays that are produced, the x-ray photons. The target window is fashioned to minimally interfere with or absorb the x-rays. It is usually about five centimeters square and it's usually at a place on the enclosure that has been made thinner than the rest. And this thinned section reduces the amount of absorption by the enclosure, either the metal or the glass enclosures. The anode is the positive end of the tube and it provides the target for the electron interaction to pr produce the x-ray photons and it's an electrical and thermal conductor. Remember that electricity is flowing through the x-ray tube and the electrons flowing from the cathode to the anode are a part of that flow of electricity. Some of the electrons are going to interact with the target to produce the x-rays, and then the rest continue as current flow through the x-ray circuit. Remember too, that a tremendous amount of heat is also generated during the process, and the anode is designed to dissipate this heat. There are two designs for the anode. One is the stationary anode, this is basically a tungsten button embedded in a copper rod. It is called stationary because the target does not move. Stationary anodes were used in old tube designs and may still be found in dental offices or those requiring very small exposure techniques. The primary disadvantage of this design is that because the electrons always hit the same small target area, heat builds up rapidly and can damage the tube. This problem limits the exposure technique factors that can be used. This limitation spurred the development of the rotating anode design. 
So shown here in this picture is a stationary anode removed from the glass envelope. So it's just the tube. And you can see the silver colored tungsten button and the discolored area where electrons interacted with it. The rotating anode design is used in general purpose tubes today. It consists of a rotating disc, and the disc is made of molybdenum, and this is a core material coated with tungsten and mounted on a copper shaft with a molybdenum core. The purpose of rotating the anode is to spread the tremendous heat produced during x-ray production over a larger surface area. Instead of electrons always striking the same small surface area as with the stationary anodes, the electrons will strike only a small part of the total anode surface area at one time, and then that area is going to change constantly because it's rotating. The focal spot becomes a focal track with the rotating anode, and then the heat buildup spreads over the focal track circumference rather than only on one spot with the stationary. This greatly increases the heat load capacity and the exposure techniques that can be used. So we can use higher exposure techniques than the stationary only uses the very low exposure techniques like in a dental unit. Um, shown in this picture here, this is anode type B, which is a rotating anode removed from the glass envelope. You can see the focal track along the edge of the disc and then some damage from extensive use is visible and that's the pitting. You can see pitting along that focal track. Copper is used as part of the shaft because it has an excellent thermal and electrical conductive property. Molybdenum is used as the disc base and core because it has a low thermal conductivity which slows the migration of heat into the rotor bearings, and this will minimize the heat damage. It is a light but strong alloy, making it easier to rotate the anode. The target material coating is made of tungsten because it has a very high melting point. The melting point's 3400 degrees Celsius or 6152 degrees Fahrenheit, and its thermal conductivity is almost equal to that of copper. It has a high atomic number of 74, improving the efficiency of the x-ray production. Rhenium may also be added to the tungsten to increase thermal capacity and strength. The anode is rotated using an induction motor, and the two major parts of this motor are the stator and the rotor. The stator is made up of electromagnets arranged in pairs around the rotor, and the stator is outside the tube enclosure, so outside of the glass envelope. The rotor is made up of an iron core. The iron core is made up of iron bars that are embedded in the copper shaft, and it's surrounded by coils and located in the center of the stator, but within the glass envelope within that enclosure. The rotor does not touch the stator, nor is it supplied with electric current. The induction motor is operated through mutual induction. The stators are energized in opposing pairs and induce an electric current in the rotor with an associated magnetic field. This induced field opposes that of the stator pair and the rotor turns to correct that orientation. Just as the two fields align, the next pair of stators is energized and again a new electric current and magnetic field are induced. This causes the rotor to turn again. This process continues with the energizing of each pair of stators in sequence. The response of the rotor is to continuously turn as the induced magnetic fields try to orient with the ever-changing external fields. Using an induction motor allows for the rotation of the anode in a vacuum tube without engineering a motor into the vacuum. Such motors are capable of rotating the anode at speeds of 3400 revolutions per minute RPMs for general purpose tubes and 10,000 RPMs for specialty tubes. Shown in this figure here, you can see an, an induction motor. The operation of the opposing pairs of stators in sequence ultimately cause rotation of the rotor. 
Notice in this figure here that the face of the target is angled. This makes use of the line focus principle. The line focus principle states that by angling the face of the anode target, a large actual focal spot size, which is the area actually bombarded with the filament electrons, um, can be maintained and then a small effective focal spot size, the x-ray beam area as seen from the perspective of the patient can be created. The actual focal spot is the area being bombarded by the filament electrons. The size of the electron stream depends on the size of the filament. The smaller the stream, the greater the heat generated in a small area. Therefore, it is desirable to have a larger actual focal spot area, and the effective focal spot is the origin of the x-ray beam and is the area as seen from the patient's perspective. The smaller this area of origin, the sharper the image will be. It's desirable to keep this as small as practical to improve image quality. When the angle of the target face is less than 45 degrees, the effective focal spot will be smaller than the actual focal spot. The target angles are 7 to 18 degrees for general purpose tube, with 12 degrees being the most common. The smaller the anode angle, the smaller the effective focal spot will be while maintaining a large actual focal spot area. This means that a large actual focal spot for heat dissipation is maintained, but a small effective focal spot to improve image quality is created. The smaller the effective focal spot, the sharper the image will be. It should be noted that anode target angle is determined based on the intended use of the tube and is not something that the radiographer selects at the operating console. For example, the angles are optimized for MAMO units, angio units, general radiography units, and so on. Shown in this figure here, you can see the target angle and line focus principle. There are two different target angles illustrated here, and it shows the effect of the target angle on the effective focal spot size. And you can see the smaller the target angle, the smaller the effective focal spot size. Although the line focus principle achieves the goal of balance between heat area and projected focal spot, it is not without trade-offs. When the target angle becomes too small, the x-ray beam area may not be large enough to fully expose a 14 by 17 IR at a 40 inch SID. Such angle limitations are taken into consideration when the x-ray tube is designed and manufactured. Additionally, the angle causes the intensity of the x-ray beam to be less on the anode side because the heel of the target is in the path of the beam. This means that the x-rays on the anode side must first penetrate a portion of the target before exiting the tube. Some do not have the energy to do so and are absorbed in the target heel, reducing the intensity on the anode side. So this phenomenon is called the anode heel effect. Notice in the figure here, the percentage difference in x-ray beam intensity from the cathode to the anode side. The lowering of intensity on the anode side of the beam can cause the image to be lighter on that end. And this is because there are fewer energy photons, high energy photons on the anode side and not enough that penetrate the patient to expose the IR. This is particularly true of film screen technology, and for some examinations, placing the thinner or less dense portion of the patient's anatomy under the anode can partially compensate for this and improve the image quality. This is less of an issue with digital technology because these systems can record and display many shades of gray called the dynamic range. Digital systems have a wide dynamic range, meaning that they can, actually, they can accurately detect, record, and display very high and very low X-ray photon intensities. In the case of the anode heel effect, the lower intensities on the anode side will still be detected and accurately displayed on the final image for digital. 
However, it is still useful for the radiographer to be mindful of this and understand the anode heel effect, even though we're using digital radiology now and hardly any film screen. The cathode is the negative end of the tube and it provides the source of electrons needed for x-ray production. The cathode is made up of the filaments and the focusing cup and is connected to two different parts of the x-ray circuit. The filaments are connected to the filament circuit and the focusing cup is connected to the secondary circuit. In this picture here, you can see a front view of the cathode focusing cup with the two filaments that are situated within it. On the left hand side, you can see the wire filament for the large focal spot and you can notice that the large focal spot filament is obviously bigger than the small focal spot filament on the right hand side. Um, then you can see the focusing cup goes around those two wire filaments. Most general purpose tubes that we see have two filaments. They're referred to as a dual focus tube. These two filaments are represented by the large and the small focal spot options, and you'll see that on the operating console. Each filament is a coil of wire. It's usually about seven to 15 millimeters long and one to two millimeters wide. They're made of tungsten with 1% to 2% thorium added to them. Tungsten is used because it has a very high melting point and does not vaporize easily. And then thorium is added to it because it is a radioactive metallic element and it increases the thermionic emission. The thermionic emission is the boiling off of electrons from the focusing cup. The thorium being added to the tungsten also helps extend the filament life. The filaments are situated parallel to each other inside the focusing cup, like in the picture we just saw, and they share a common ground wire. The focusing cup is made of nickel and it surrounds each filament on its back and sides. The front is open and it faces the anode or the target. The focusing cup receives a strong negative charge from the secondary circuit that forces the electrons together into an electron cloud as they are boiled off of the filament, which is the thermionic emission. The size, shape, and charge of the focusing cup, as well as how the filaments are designed and placed within it, affect how well it focuses the electrons on the target. So all of these things that are taken into consideration in the design give us the optimum performance. The focusing cup serves its function through electrostatic repulsion, and that is its negative charge is greater than the negative charges of the electrons, and that forces them together. The individual electron negative charges would cause them to repel each other and scatter as they are boiled off the filament. So we have to have this focusing cup that keeps that beam of electrons together. At the operating console, the RT selects the desired exposure factors, the KVP, the mass, and the focal spot size. On some units, the focal spot size may be an automated function. When the exposure switch is first pressed, some of the electricity is diverted to the induction motor of the x-ray tube, and this is to bring the rotor up to speed. Some RTs you'll hear call this hitting the rotor. And that's that first, there's a two-step button. So the first part of the button of the exposure switch or the exposure button, um, when you push it halfway down, it's starting the rotor. And when you push it all the way down, then it's releasing the electrons. So inside the x-ray tube is an induction motor and the induction motor turns the anode at approximately 3,400 RPMs or faster depending on the tube type and the purpose of it. 
and it spreads the generated heat over a larger total surface area. At the same time that the rotor is spinning, the selected filament is energized until the desired degree of thermionic emission is achieved. So the rotor keeps spinning until those electrons get hot enough at the filament and boil off. And that's when we push the exposure button all the way down. It's going to release those electrons all the way across from the cathode to the anode. And then that's where the creation of the X-ray photons occurs. So prepping the rotor is the first phase of the two-phase switch of the exposure switch. The second phase actually initiates the X-ray production process. So the process from rotor preparation to exposure only lasts a few seconds, with the actual exposure generally measured in milliseconds. When the exposure switch is pressed, the voltage from the auto transformer, which is controlled by the KVP selector, passes to the step-up transformer, or in the case of high-frequency generators, it goes to capacitor banks and then the inverter circuit, and then the step-up transformer. The voltage and current then passes through the rectifier bank before passing to the anode and cathode of the x-ray tube so that the anode is always positive and the cathode is always negative. The voltage creates a huge potential difference between the electrodes. With the preparation phase, some of the power from the auto transformer was diverted to the filament circuit, where it passes through a rheostat, which control, is controlled by the MA selector, and then it goes to a step-down transformer, then to the selected filament that you determined on the control panel, either the small or the large filament that is within the cathode focusing cup. The current heats the filament to a point of incandescence, which means it becomes white hot. So it's so hot, it turns white. And then the electrons are literally boiled off of the filament by thermionic emission. The focusing cup forms them into a cloud. It's called an electron cloud. And this cloud is also called a space charge. This space charge is self-limiting. Once the space charge reaches a size commensurate with the current used, it becomes difficult for additional electrons to be emitted, and this self-limiting factor is called the space charge effect. There are three things needed to produce x-rays. One, we have to have a large potential difference to give kinetic energy to the filament electrons and this is provided by the KVP setting. Two, we have to have a vehicle on which kinetic energy can ride. And this is the quantity of electrons provided by mass. Number three, we need a place for interaction. And that's the target of the anode. So we need those three things to be able to produce x-rays. The electron cloud is attracted to the anode target because of the huge potential difference. In fact, um, these filament electrons will reach speeds of about half the speed of light in just one to three centimeters from the focusing cup to the anode target. Because the electron cloud flows from cathode to anode, it is a continuation of the flow of electricity throughout the X-ray circuit. There is, very, there is one very important detour in this flow of electrons. As they penetrate the target surface, these filament electrons interact with the atoms of tungsten, and that will generate the heat and x-rays, and it generates 99% heat and 1% x-ray. Shown in this figure here, this is showing x-ray production. In the process of X-ray production, you can see that the electrons are being boiled off of the filament and they're attracted to the anode. 
And then at the anode, they will interact with the target atoms, and this will produce the heat and then the X-ray photons. So you can see um, the anode is spinning. It is a rotating anode, so it is spinning. And then you can see the focusing cup and the purple, and that's the filament there. And then the little dots of purple, that is your electron cloud, and that is where the thermionic emission is going to happen. And those electrons are boiling off of that focusing cup and then going at a very high velocity towards the anode where they're going to be stopped. So that anode or target will stop those electrons, and that's how our X-ray photons are produced. Remember, X-ray photons coming from the cathode, um, actually, you know, at the focusing cup of the cathode, they have a high velocity, so they're being sent from cathode to anode, very, very fast rate. They hit the target, so they're suddenly stopped at the target, and then the electrons turn into heat and x-ray. So 99% of those electrons are gonna turn into heat with 1% turning into x-ray photons and then leaving the tube. Several factors can shorten the life of an x-ray tube or even damage it. Most have to do with the thermal characteristics of x-ray production and are within your control. The frequent use of very high or maximum exposure factors, the use of lower but very long exposure factors, and overloading the filament, which is prolonged excessive heating caused by prepping the rotor unnecessarily or arcing from the filament, are the major causes of tube failure. So remember at the beginning of this chapter, we talked about the built-in methods that help dissipate the heat and help to protect the tube. And this was the oil bath and the cooling fans, right, that are inside of that glass envelope. Additionally, there are rotating anodes, and the rotating anodes are going to spread the heat over a larger surface area, and this will help with the heat load problem. The use of heat tolerant materials in the construction of the tube also help deal with the heat load as well. And then radiation cooling of the anode is also used. The anode radiates heat within the tube away from itself. So there are three processes of heat transfer at play. There is the conduction of heat by heat tolerant materials. There's the radiation of heat energy from the anode to the oil bath. And then there is the convection of heat into the room by the cooling fans. Modern x-ray machines have protective circuits built in that prevent the use of unsafe exposure techniques. And it also pre prevents the heat overloads of the x-ray tube. However, even with all of these safety measures, the radiographer must understand anode thermal capacity and keep in mind that the production of x-rays is a very inefficient process with almost 99% of the energy used being converted to heat and only 1% is converted to x-ray. Prior to the introduction of protective circuits, Rating charts were used to determine if a particular combination of exposure factors were safe or unsafe for the x-ray tube. Cooling charts were used to determine the cooling time needed before continued operation or to prevent exceeding the maximum heat loads. These charts are fairly simple to use and they provide a good visual understanding of heat load and thermal capacity. The tube rating chart plots three technical factors. There's kilovoltage peak, milliamperage, and exposure time. And shown here are two different charts. So some charts have the kilovoltage peak as the y-axis, exposure time as the x-axis, and milliamperage lines as curves on the graph. And you can see that in chart B. 
And then in chart A, it has the milliamperage as the y-axis, exposure time as the x-axis, and the kilovoltage peak lines as curves on the graph. Either way, the charts work the same. In the first type, um, you'll use the kilovoltage peak and exposure time to plot a point on the graph. And if that point is on or above the specified milliamperage line, it is unsafe. And you can see that on chart B. The other one is the milliamperage and time are used to plot a point on the graph. And if the point is on or above the KVP line, the technique is unsafe. And that's shown in chart A. So you can see the two two breeding charts here. There's the two versions. A is going to plot the milliamperage line and B is going to plot the kilovoltage peak line, but they both serve the same purpose. So to better understand how much heat may be produced during an exposure, you have to first be aware of the concept of heat units or HUs. HUs measure the amount of heat stored in a particular device. For the x-ray tube, heat units are calculated using the following formula, KVP times MA times seconds times C, in which KVP is the kilovoltage selected, MA is the milliamperage station that's selected, and S is the exposure time in seconds. The C represents a correction factor and it just depends on the generator type being used. So if you're using a single phase generator, then C would be 1.0. If you're using a three phase six pulse, C would be 1.35. Three phase 12 pulse, C would be 1.41. And for a high frequency generator, C is 1.45. So if multiple exposures are made using a given technique, the answer from this formula is multiplied by the number of exposures. And then you can quickly see that heat is a major factor in the damage done to an x-ray tube over thousands of exposures. So seen in this picture here, you have the anode cooling chart to the left and then the housing cooling chart to the right and they both work the same way. The anode cooling chart is used to determine the time it takes for the anode to cool based on the factors given. And then the housing cooling chart does the same for the tube housing. The y-axis represents the heat units and it's usually expressed in thousands. And the x-axis represents time and it's usually in minutes. The curve that is plotted on the graph is the cooling curve. And this is going to represent heat dissipation over time. So basically how long it takes for the tube to cool. To extend tube life, there are simple procedures and guidelines that have to be followed. First, the warm-up steps specific to the unit should be followed completely and routinely. Just like warming up a car on a very cold day, Doing so warms the engine slowly and prepares it for normal operation. So the x-ray tube is similar to that. It should be warmed up before normal operation. Newer units may have automatic warm-up protocols, so you might not have to do anything. They do it themselves. Second, do not prep the rotor excessively. This pre-exposure phase maintains the filament in an energized state and shortens its useful life. It's usually preferable to press both the rotor and exposure buttons simultaneously so that the filament is heated for the minimum time necessary. The machine will not apply the high voltage until the rotor reaches full operating speed. And that's what I do. Um, I don't push it down halfway and then all the way. I don't do the two-step process. I just push it all the way down all at one time. And then third, do not routinely use extreme exposure factors. Consistent, consistently using single very high exposure values is going to result in the pitting of the anode, which is where small areas of the anode actually melt. 
and then this can cause irregular outputs. Consistently using low but very long exposures can also result in une uneven heating and wear. Excessive heating may also cause heat transfer to the bearings of the rotor, and this heating of the bearings of the rotor can damage the bearings. And this will result in uneven rotation speed of the anode and damage to the tube.